What slides are pointless in a pitch deck? The two I would probably point to are, the two that I, I don't like are uh, uh, slides on exit strategy. Um, you know, I think you know, there are certain businesses out there that are built in a particular way just to be focused on flipping quickly to a very specific kind of buyer. And if that's the, if that's the whole strategy, then great. But you know, most of us are out there trying to build a business that creates value. And once you've created that value, hopefully you have a number of options as to where, as to how you, how you monetize it. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the classic boring exit slide of, you know, we're gonna build this thing in three to five years and look at an IPO or look at a trade sale, you know, it just doesn't add a whole lot. I think as long as, and again, unless you're some specialty business where you have a much longer time horizon or don't plan to exit or aren't willing to exit, um, you know, so there are exceptions. But for the most part, I think if you're a typical business, you're out there to try to build the thing, create value, and then find your exit route when the time comes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other one is, is the sort of detailed financial protections, particularly in early stages. I mean, I just, you know, everyone knows how to draw a hockey stick. Everyone knows how to sort of make things look really good. I can tell you a lot. You know so little about the future. You know, looking at the next 12 months, looking at drivers like unit economics, that's great, and I think that's really helpful. I think these long-term projections, even though they're sort of a necessity in the sense that everybody asks for them, just not something that I think is all that useful. No, I, what about I, I completely agree with both of those. I think it depends on what stage you're at in yeah. your business, right? So assuming that you're, you're an early stage business, whereas you assert most things are unknown, and that's part of the beauty of it, so uh, don't try to make them up. But I think um, the biggest thing with pitch decks I believe is that people try to put way too much information yeah. on them. And all you're trying to do is get a meeting. Yep. That's all it is. So there should be loads of unanswered questions. It should be intriguing. It should be a really strong, exciting narrative that says something. But there are also questions like, well, maybe, what, what do your financial projections look like? Because you've got to have yeah. something. Maybe, what do your competitors look like? What does the space look like? So um, I think you have to kind of, it's a teaser. Yep. A deck, a pitch deck is a teaser, at least when you're sending it out at the start. All you're trying to do is just get that next meeting. How do you slice up? your investment. Oh, I like it. So um, so we raised a, we, we raised most of our money from VCs, so mm. um, predominantly a bunch of different venture funds, and then all of them were kind enough to leave it a, a space for high quality angels. Yep. So people that we knew um, who were maybe two or three steps ahead of us in the journey, mm. who understood the space, knew a lot of the people, knew what we were trying to achieve and had experience actually getting there. So that was, that was really, really helpful. So we've got, we're really lucky. We have a really good supportive investor base of different kinds of people, many in the UK, but some from, from the US as well. Um, and then how do we spend it? It's a really good question. I, I probably couldn't tell you. Um, the, the only thing I can tell you is we probably didn't spend it the way we thought we were gonna spend it. <laughs> That's the only thing I can be 100% sure about. Um, and then I guess later on in stage, I started thinking about much more about go to market and how we scale that. Um, but yeah, I think that's the key thing. It definitely wasn't the way that we thought the we'd spend thought, it. Yeah. Um, but hopefully we've done it better than that. What about you? So in terms of taking investment, you know, we've raised a number of sort of successive rounds and, you know, given what we do as a business, which is provide a platform for a wide range of different kinds of investors from retail to institutional, you know, to invest in private companies, um, not surprising that we've sort of eaten our own dog food and done that ourselves. So we've got, we've raised a bunch from venture um, and then we've got about 4,300 plus um, of our own users who've invested in us, ranging from ten pound, you know, ten pound investors all the way up to people wow. who invested hundreds of thousands. Of pounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of how we spend it, I mean, certainly at each stage we have, rightly I think, but surprisingly to me, spent more on product and tech than I expected. I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer by background. I, I have no technical ability at all, and and, and I. I remember when my co-founder and I were first working on it, I mean, I literally, we were planning some initial budgeting like post-launch, and there was all this investment in, in tech. And I was just like, well, I, I don't get this. I thought we just built the platform and 
kind of turned it on and like, yeah, I mean, I know there's got to be like something to fix bugs and or like, you know, deal with attacks. But but what do you mean we get we got to keep doing stuff? And obviously, you know, we're you know seven, eight years past that now and we're investing more than ever in in the product. I mean, I think we we're we're very much product led. So that's been a big, a big part of our spend. And then there's been all the usuals. Regulated financial services business means that our lawyers get more money than we probably <laughs> would like. Um, but uh, and then you know all the all the other all the other stuff in there. How did you adapt your pitch deck for different investors? I remember one thing we did, which is silly, but I remember there was a point at which we had a, a U.S. strategy that we've now put on hold. But we were raising money both here and talking to a bunch of U.S. investors um, about potentially potentially financing a U.S. expansion. Um, and I was very, very focused on making sure that everything in the U.S. deck was in dollars. And I just knew it would be a point of friction. I knew I'd be going into meetings and be like, so you did X pounds, now what's that? How do I, you know, I mean, even from really, really smart VCs. So I, to the currency conversion, silly as it was, 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 was one of them. I, you know, it's always the same message and it's always the same things that we're trying to communicate. It's just levels of assumed knowledge that, that you know, I think, I think differ. I think with, with more retail type investors, we're just keen to spell out steps A to Z more closely. So it's more, I think it's levels of explanation and technicalities more than any real changes to the, to the, 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 the sort of substance. What about you? What? Do you know what? I, I don't think we did. And now I'm wondering whether that was because I was being really smart and shrewd about it mm -hmm. or just because I was being lazy. But <laughs> I think we, so one of the things we did do was stick with dollars on everything. Um, mm. And actually that kind of made investors in the UK feel like we were spending more time getting money in the US. So That's interesting. It's, I think it sort of helped a little bit, um, the move on it. But So we stick everything in dollars and Tried, I guess tried to write a pitch deck that was pretty clear and, and transparent for everyone. But I have to say we were, we've were we raised all our money from broadly the same kinds of people, right? right? Like the vast majority of it's been venture capital who are looking for the same things yeah. and generally have the same level of understanding. So, so maybe we haven't need to, or maybe I'm just lazy, <laughs> which I shouldn't be saying on camera. But if you have different pitch decks for different kinds of people, is that not a nightmare to manage? You got questions and feedback yeah. on different ones and different things, and you can't remember who you sent to what. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in no more than two versions of a deck if okay. you if you if you if you get into much you know many more versions than that i mean you've just got yeah a, a complete night so what do you do you kind of have a, a deck for people who are really well versed in the tech ecosystem and maybe understand the game better and a tech for people who are perhaps tech isn't their primary investment focus yeah i think i think that's probably the the way to the, that sounds smart, the, the, the way to the way we often think about it and it depends i mean i think or, you know sometimes you know you can also have sort of the same high level deck and then sort of some more detailed stuff that goes to different 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 people what would you say is the most important spend for any company i guess it depends on the business right i from a tech perspective i always think product i think increasingly the level of um, product execution that consumers or enterprise customers demand is is on, on the old hockey stick. So I think um, it's much harder to meet demands of what good product is. So I think you can never really invest too heavily in product. Um, and the other thing I'd say, and perhaps this is just incredibly on brand for who we are, but is in people. And it, it takes a long time, we've seen, for companies to uh, really start thinking about how they invest in their people function, whether that means uh, actually rolling out structures for performance reviews or uh, you know strategies for how to get feedback. It's the kind of thing that doesn't come until problems start appearing, mm -hmm. and once problems start appearing, often it's too late to solve them. So I think um, I think it's really important to invest in that and invest in that early, particularly if you're on a high growth path and you know you're expecting to be 50, 100, 150 mm -hmm. people within a short space of time. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I agree thoroughly on product, but the, the balancing thing to that, I think where we may have underspent or not gotten our spend right as much early on as in marketing. You know, I mean, I think there is the danger always that you have the better product. And I'm always very conscious. I mean, the story from, I mean, I'm dating myself here, but the story from, from my childhood is VHS and Betamax because, you know, Betamax was, by all accounts, a superior video recording technology. Everyone thought so at the time, but VHS was so much better from a marketing and distribution perspective that it won out as the standard. If you are neck deep in the product, day in and day out, 
you become, you know, it becomes very easy to be like, well, this is, you know, this is so clearly superior to what, what else is out on the market. Everybody's going to realize this so obviously. Yeah. Where actually, if you're trying to just get slivers of people's attention and try to distinguish yourself, you know, maybe that extra feature they're not going to necessarily notice so quickly. It's, it's the whole, I always remember, so product market fit is you yeah. know, the, the term that everyone bandies around. And I always remember having a board meeting where we were talking about the market. And people forget, you know, product market fit is often think about what product needs to right. happen. Whereas not enough people think about what's the market, what's the market? fit. Yeah. Because yeah. actually that's the other side of the equation. You yeah. can create a brilliant product. If you don't know who you're creating it for, you get stuck. Exactly. Um, how did you balance your time between raising and running your company? Badly. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, was, I, I, was really, I was really very bad at that. I mean, I think that... The reality is that I basically wasn't running the business while we were fundraising. I was very fortunate in that, you know, on the people side, we'd done very well with a few of our early hires, and we had a few senior people who were just fantastic at making sure the business continued to, 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 to do what it needed to do in my absence. But, you know, from a mind space perspective, when I was fundraising, I found it very difficult to concentrate on anything else. And because, of course, you are at these early stages, I mean, the fundraising is an existential point. I mean, I think, you know, if you're a profitable company and it's just about, oh, maybe we could raise some money to do a bit of growth here, maybe we'll do that next year, it might be a different story. But when it's just like, you know, you see the, you see the burn down chart, you know, you, you see how long you've got, I found it very difficult to focus on almost anything else. And I have the utmost admiration uh, for any founder uh, or any chief executive who is able to do um, to do both. Hopefully, you were better at it. Do you, do you know what? We, I think we were better, but I don't think that was down to me. <laughs> I, like we, so you know, I came from a business background, and we were talking about this earlier, where you know we didn't raise money, so we invested off the balance mm -hmm. sheet, and that's how we grew. So I was very familiar with this idea that building a company is about creating something that everyone wants and then selling it. And there are these two very distinct categories, yep. whatever it was, product, service, whatever, and then you've got to work out how to distribute it and get it in front of people's hands. And then we started in, in, in this game where we had to raise a lot of money and I realized I was this third pillar. And it was third and it was just as big as the yeah. other two. Which is like, in order to do these two, you need the, the funding to be able to make that happen. So I always thought it might be like 10, 15% yep. of my job, and it definitely became 30, 40, at times 70 or 80, right? And I, and I was super lucky. I've worked with my best mate from school since I was 18. And effectively he runs a business and, and on a day-to-day on -day basis. And it has always allowed me a lot more space to be able to do those things. So I think fundraising down to him didn't affect our, uh, our, our challenges of business as much as it could have done, but it definitely made me aware. I don't know how soul founders do it. You know, you meet, you meet soul founders who, who do it all on their plate. No, I just, no idea. Yeah, no, machines. Yeah, Clearly. I think that's right. <laughs> What's the first thing you spent on when you raised? Well, I think we were about a week over John's salary, so I think we did, <laughs> I think we did that. Um, uh, yeah, I think it was, it was clearing, clearing payroll. I don't know if we were a week overdue, but I think we had, we borrowed some money from our other company mm -hmm. to pay payroll. Uh, and then the money came in, and that was That's nice. a relief. Yeah. Yeah. I think back to our, our A round. We really went on a hiring spree, and it was, it was exactly what we needed to do because we'd all been sitting there thinking to ourselves, you know, there's all this stuff that needs doing that we're just blocked from doing because we don't have the resources. And yes, we're tech, and yes, product helps, but we need the people to build the product, and we need the people to commercialize it. When you hire quickly, you know, you make some mistakes and, you know, definitely not everybody worked out, but some people turned out great from that. Um, and I think that was, that was the right use of resources at the time. Yeah. How does the, the fundraising process change as you scale up? A lot of it is um, based on big, big idea, big dream, and sort of kind of some semblance of a smart road to how you're going to get there. So I think ultimately, I'm sure you would have seen this, like it, you know, you start with uh, something that's much broader, an idea, and people are buying into a team and the belief of what a market looks like. Further along, you have to demonstrate progress. And then as I understand it, we're not there then, but then it comes down to unit economics and yep. what does this business actually look like when it's at profit at scale. Mm. Um, so I think it changes quite dramatically, actually, in terms of what you're expected to have achieved at certain stages. Yeah. It's funny, I, I find, I look back and maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe my memory 
plays tricks, but we've raised a total of 30 million pounds for Sears. And the last 25, I have felt was a lot easier than the first five. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that the last 25 was easy in any, in any sense, but there was something a little bit more straightforward about it. You know, we, we had a story to tell, the business was what it was. You know, there was only so much variability in what what we could do going out there. And so it was a bit more hit or miss in the sense that you need, you know, some people writing big tickets and there are fewer of those than there are when you're looking for small tickets. But I think one of the things I found so tough when we were raising, you know, pre-revenue type money in the very early days was, you know, you would just talk to so many different people, each of whom would have slightly different responses to the story. And I, I remember I'd come back from pitch meetings where I'd change the deck a little bit in order to respond to something somebody said, and then I'd get to something else and change again. And it felt a lot less structured in many ways and a little bit more haphazard. And so that's probably the thing I've, I've liked more about the scale of fundraising process. Um, but, you know, the nice thing when you're raising small amounts of money is there's sort of an infinite number of people you can go out to in yeah. terms of angels and, and others. The bigger you get, the, the smaller the smaller the list gets. I suppose until eventually you get to the point where it's like SoftBank or SoftBank. Like, <laughs> you either, you know, either they invest in you or not. Unfortunately, we're not, not at that point yet.